Good evening. Uh, very nice to have this fine crowd here. We have a fascinating program here this evening in the forum. Bilingual education. Is it in our children's best interest? Now, that's a serious issue, and I am a rather interesting fellow. I take my work seriously, but not myself, but it really not much of levity to say. We've had a wonderful discussion uh, in the dinner where our good moderator was the presenter. That was interesting stuff. And, uh, and uh, Christopher Edley uh, shared a great deal of the president's new proposal. So welcome to you uh, in the Institute of Politics. It's a great honor to be the director. Uh, and. Uh, the purpose of the entire institute is to try to inspire people to public life. And there are many of you here who I hope are finding that to be so. It is difficult of, of presentation, but it is a very wonderful part of life, public service. And so we have here tonight uh, those who will present uh, this uh, fascinating topic. And uh, so let me introduce first uh, Dan Schnur. Dan is currently a fellow at the Institute of Politics. Uh, his study group, which is held Tuesdays at 4 o'clock, is titled California, Where Tomorrow's Politics Happen Today. He is the former director of communications for Governor Pete Wilson and former communications director for the California Republican Party. He has served as a political analyst and commentator for many California radio stations and newspapers and is uh, certainly uh, giving us a great uh, opportunity to hear him and to, and to work with the students. Uh, Dan, there you are. I have uh, learned after a, a month here now that if I refer to uh, my introducer as Senator Simpson, he will get mad at me in the morning. So Al, thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate the plug for my study group, and for those of you that weren't taking notes, that's Tuesdays, 4 to 5.30 in the Institute of Politics. And specifically for those of you who are interested in tonight's topic, um, I'd urge you to attend the study group we're holding not Tuesday, but uh, the following Tuesday, on the 17th of this month, in which we'll bring in members of the California State Legislature to talk about the emerging Hispanic American majority in California and how it affects our states and our nation's politics. Uh, the reason I've been asked to speak here, I think, and to some extent the reason that this debate is taking place here tonight at all, is because of a ballot initiative that the people of California will vote on this spring, this June, that would dramatically change the way that non-English speaking students are taught in the schools of our state. Unlike at, uh, unlike at least some of our, our panelists tonight, I did not have the good fortune to be born in California. Uh, but rather several years ago had the good sense to move there. And we Californians are inordinately proud of the various exports that we have sent to all of you in the East. Not just vegetables and fruits and semiconductors, not just skateboards and hula hoops, but political exports as well. We've exported Jerry Brown and Ronald Reagan, something to like and dislike on both sides of the political aisle, tax cuts and term limits, environmentalism and health care reform. And now it appears that we are on the verge of uh, exporting our most recent public policy debate, that debate on the, on, on the fate of bilingual education in our state. One of the themes that I've tried to get across during my time here at the Kennedy School is the profound effect that our, uh, that our state has had on the rest of the nation, economically, culturally, politically, and demographically. Uh, Wallace Stegner said that California is America, only more so. And although he was not talking specifically about California's rich cultural and demographic mix, he may, well have, he may well have been. Because over the past few decades, while the percentage of whites in our state has gradually declined as a percentage of the population, while the number of African Americans is held relatively constant, the number of Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans in California has increased dramatically to the point where by the year 2000, whites will actually make up less than 50% of California's population Hispanics, meanwhile, Hispanic Americans now constitute roughly one third of the state's population, and Asian Americans are about 18%. Both numbers are expected to increase, in, increase rapidly in the years ahead. Now, these same cultural and demographic shifts 
are beginning to be seen across the United States, and I suspect it will be seen even more quickly in the near future. What me which means that public policy debates that we have engaged in in California on issues like illegal immigration, on racial and gender preferences, and now on bilingual education are coming your way as well. Now, although tonight's uh, discussion on bilingual education is going to take place primarily, primarily at least, at the level of public policy, the, Engl the uh, debate over the English for the Children Initiative, or Proposition 226, will take place to a large degree in the context of electoral politics. So the organizers of tonight's forum thought it would be useful before the debate gets underway for me to try and provide you with some sense of the political landscape on which this battle will be fought. So I'm going to spend just a minute or two, therefore, attempting to do just that, to provide some context and some recent political history that led our state to this point, and to give you an idea of some of the political baggage that Californians will be carrying with them as they make their decision on how they're going to vote on this question later this spring. Historically, and I'm speaking of recent political history, there are two important things to keep in mind as we enter into this debate. First, Californians have just completed, or I should say are in the process of completing, two very public, very bitter, and very divisive fights on the issues of illegal immigration on the 1994 general election ballot and racial and gender pref preferences in 1996. So sensitivities in our state are very high for an issue that has the potential to be just as volatile. And to this point, uh, both sides of the fight over this ballot proposition have avoided this kind of rhetoric. And it's to the credit of both Mr. Runs and Mr. Honda and to their respective supporters that this debate so far in our state has remained on the level of public policy without degenerating to a lower level. Second, the issue of bilingual education is not a new one in California. Bills have been, bills have been introduced in the California State Legislature now for 10 consecutive years in a variety of ways that would reform our process of bilingual education. And each of those bills has died every year in a legislative committee without the benefit of coming to the full legislature for a vote. So there are those in our state and elsewhere who would argue that ballot initiatives are a clumsy way of making public policy, that they're a sledgehammer as opposed to a scalpel that legislative policy development can achieve. And for the most part, I and I think most people would agree with them. But not just on this issue of bilingual education, but on all public policy matters, the people of California have historically turned to our initiative process when, uh, as an outlet for their frustrations when they don't see their elected officials dealing, in their opinion, forthrightly with an issue uh, that is important to them. And bilingual education is the most recent example, I think, of that dynamic. One last point I'll make before turning the program back to the people who you've come here to hear. And I'd like to talk very briefly about what the public opinion polls in California are showing right now as it relates to this issue. Most statewide polls taken by the mainstream media show that this ballot initiative has between two-thirds and 80 percent support of all Californians. And each of these polls has showed, interestingly enough, even larger numbers of support among Hispanic American voters. But like all, all polls, as all of you know, a lot of this depends on how the question is asked. When La Opinion, the uh, uh, Spanish uh, language newspaper based in Los Angeles, posed a question to Hispanic American residents of California on this issue, they asked them very specifically, do you favor an end to bilingual education? And, for, and to that question, the levels of support dropped fairly dramatically, which suggests a potential window of opportunity for the proposition's opponents. So, uh, so we're about three months away from deciding this issue in California. The advertising wars haven't started yet. The name calling that too often characterizes these kind of campaigns has not yet been seen and hopefully will not be seen. But tonight we'll have the opportunity to hear leading spokespersons on both sides of this issue make their case to you. And when you pick up the newspaper in early June and uh, you see what those crazy Californians are sending you to deal with this year, just remember you heard it here first. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dan. You're a great addition to the, to the fellow program. Now let me introduce uh, Christopher Edley. He's been a professor of law at Harvard Law School since 1981. In 1995, he served as a special counsel to the president. He assisted in the White House review of affirmative action programs. He's the author of Not All Black and White, Affirmative Action, Race, and American Values. 
He is co-direct co-director of Harvard's Civil Rights Project. Very steady, thoughtful, patient man, and a longtime good friend of the Institute of Politics and the moderator of the evening's forum. Christopher. Thanks very much. It is an honor to have been asked by the students to, uh, to moderate this panel, and uh, I'm going to rule with an iron fist. Uh, and uh, I've already warned the panelists of that, uh, so in advance let me warn the audience uh, of that. Um, as an academic matter, I'd ask you or encourage you to bear two things in mind. Uh, this issue is, uh, is critically important uh, because of the role of education as a gateway to opportunity. But it's also critically important because it's a window on the question of national identity and how it is formed and what we mean by community. There's a great deal at stake apart from the politics of various ethnic and racial factions in one state, this is really about America in the 21st century. Our first speaker, the way we're going to do this is that we're going to hear from, uh, from uh, our two political leaders uh, and then from our two uh, researchers. and. Uh, and we're going to alternate between uh, uh, opponents of current bilingual education and folks on the other side of the issue. I'll let you define. Uh, I'll let you define how you would stake it out. Uh, but we'll begin with Ron Unz, uh, the Honorable Ron Unz, uh, who was the 1994 challenger to incumbent California Governor Pete Wilson. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist by training president and CEO of Wall Street Analytics, Inc., a financial services software company he founded in 1987. Uh, and he's chairman and author of the English for the Children initiative campaign in California. Mr. Anz. Thank you very much. I, I guess what I thought I'd do is give you a brief background of how the initiative evolved and then a little bit of coverage of the initiative. And then obviously, as the debate evolves in Q&A, we can get into a lot more details of the sort of things you're most interested in. Now, uh, I'm somebody who's always been very interested in public policy issues as far back as I can remember, especially issues that deal with questions of race and ethnicity and social policy, which I think are very important in a multi-ethnic society like the United States. And in particular, I've always been very skeptical of bilingual education. I never really thought it made much sense. For example, my uh, mother was born in Los Angeles, but she grew up not speaking any English at all. And then when she went to school, she very quickly learned English and actually ended up graduating college with uh, high honors with a degree in English literature. So it never seemed to make sense to me as to why children would not be taught English as soon as they start school. Now, on the other hand, the origins of this particular initiative effort came in 1996 when I read a series of articles in Los Angeles Times describing how a group of immigrant Latino parents in downtown Los Angeles had to actually begin a public boycott of their local elementary school because it was refusing to teach the children English. And that seemed very strange to me. In other words, I'd always viewed bilingual education as being a failure. But there's a big difference between a program being a failure and when it's gone off the deep end and gone into insanity to the point where schools refuse to allow children to learn English. When I had some time and I was down in Los Angeles, I decided to investigate the issue a little bit more carefully. And I set up a meeting with some of the parents involved in that boycott, along with the local immigrant rights activist who was working with them, just to see whether the stories were true or whether they'd gotten distorted in the media. And it turns out everything really was true. The school was refusing to teach the children English, despite the parents' wishes. And the parents had to actually start carrying picket signs outside the school until finally the school backed down and agreed to teach the children English. Now, they also emphasized to me that some of the worst aspects of the bilingual education system are not really what people think of. In other words, there's a perception out there when children go through these programs, they leave the public school system not being able to speak English properly. And that really is false. In other words, we live in a society where movies and TV and the larger culture is so heavily English oriented that even if English is not taught much in the public schools, the children certainly one way or the other will learn English. 
But the point that was made to me is that under the system of bilingual education, where children are not introduced to written English generally until as late as the fourth or fifth grade, which is very late to learn how to read and write, the end result is that many of these students leave the public schools not being able to read and write English, not being literate in English, even if they can speak it all right. And obviously, if you leave school not being able to read or write English properly, you really have very limited options in front of you, and that leads to a lot of other problems in our society. At that stage, I decided to do a little bit more investigation on the statistics on bilingual education in California, and the numbers were staggering to me. I'm somebody who's been interested in this issue, but I was completely unaware of how bad they were, and virtually everybody else I've discussed the issue with during our campaign had also been completely unaware of how bad the numbers looked. Today in the state of California, and these are the official government statistics from the Office of Bilingual Instruction, today in the state of California, a quarter of all the children in public schools don't know English. And of the ones who don't know English, only five or six percent successfully learn English each year. That is not a misprint, five or six percent per year. Ninety-five percent of the students who start a given school year in California not knowing English are still classified as not knowing English at the end of that same school year. And that is insane when you're talking about young children who can learn another language very quickly and easily. I also found out that the current law governing bilingual education in California has actually expired 11 years ago. The law ended 11 years ago, but just as was mentioned, the state legislature and the politicians in Sacramento had been deadlocked for 11 straight years on whether to renew the law or modify it or do something about it, with the end result is that the policy was in complete state of paralysis and gridlock. Therefore, the only option of actually changing the system would be through the initiative process. And I ban began to consider putting an initiative on the ballot to get rid of bilingual education. Now, there's actually a lot of misconceptions about what we call bilingual education in the United States, in particular in California. Bilingual education has absolutely nothing to do with learning two languages. That's a very common identification of the term, but it really doesn't. What we call transitional bilingual education, which is 99% of these programs, are designed with only one goal, and that goal is to teach the English language to the children in school. It is not designed to help the children become literate in their original native language. It is simply designed to teach English. And it is designed to teach English by not teaching English, by teaching the children for several years only in their native language. The ideology, well, the educational theory that it's based on, I'm extraordinarily skeptical about. And anyone who's really reviewed the research in detail sees that there's very little basis for it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It is the idea that the best way for a child to learn English when they start school at the age of five is for them to be given several years of virtually only native language instruction with a relatively small amount of English, bringing them up to about the third grade level in their native language, at which point they find it very easy to learn English, switch over to English, and never end up getting above the third grade level in their own native language. The end result is that these children generally leave the public schools at about the third grade level in their native language and in the English language which means that you know, obviously going on to college is really just beyond them. That is really the core of what we're talking about in the system. Now, at the point I started thinking about doing an initiative, I really felt that since most of the people I'd been involved with or talked with over the years had been skeptics of bilingual education, it would probably be worth my meeting and talking with the leading activists and academics and organizations who support bilingual education to see whether I was missing something in the statistics and how the numbers could look so bad if the program really worked. So I met, for example, with the leadership of the National Council of La Raza in DC. Sometime later than that, I met with the leadership of Maldif. I talked with some leading academics and professors and activists. Not one of them, not a single one, would defend the current system of bilingual education in California or in the United States. They all admitted it didn't work well. They all admitted it had terrible problems. They all said, oh, these children are being shortchanged. Their educational career is being ruined. The problem is, they said, not with the theory of bilingual education, the problem is the implementation. They all said the programs didn't have enough money or didn't have enough teachers or didn't have the right teachers or didn't have enough administrative support. And they all said, if we fix the problems with implementation, then the program will work ideally well the way it does in theory. Now, I'm somebody who comes from a scientific background. And the question I ask them is, if this program has been around in California for 25 or 30 years and it's never been made to work in all that time, 
why do you think it'll ever start working in the future? And they actually had no real answer to that. They said, well, we think it'll be made to work once we get these other resources that we need. There is no evidence whatsoever that anywhere in the United States bilingual education has worked on a large scale since in the 30 years it's been introduced. Furthermore, it is used nowhere else in the world outside the United States. No other country uses it. Every other country uses the sort of intensive short-term English immersion program that our initiative advocates. What we would do, therefore, in our initiative is to take young children when they start school if they don't know English, and by God, you teach them English. And since almost all of these children we're talking about are five or six years old, at an age when it's very easy and quick for them to learn another language like English, they would learn English very quickly, and then they'd be mainstreamed in with the other children, and that would end the issue of bilingual education, which has been around for an awfully long time, but it never really worked in that period. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Unzis, and, uh, and a great example in terms of keeping to the time limits. Uh, okay. uh, thank, you, thank you very much to, uh, to, to the panelists. Uh, we're going to open it up for, uh, for Q&A now, and uh, I'm going to try to alternate them among the microphones, beginning with this one here, and then this one. And are there microphones upstairs somewhere? Where? OK. Uh, and, uh, but I'm going to ask the first question. Um, and, uh, and, and here it is. From a civil rights perspective, uh, the courts as well as uh, enforcement agencies uh, have long viewed it as a violation of the civil rights statutes, the federal civil rights statutes, if a school district fails to provide an adequate, educate, adequate access to education for students with limited English proficiency. That would seem to suggest that adopting curriculum strategies that do not have a reasonable basis in evidence uh, for their likelihood of success in comparison with alternatives that are known uh, amounts to a civil rights violation. Are you confident enough in your prescription of this curricular methodology to say that there would be no civil rights violations flowing from adoption of your proposal? Yes. Uh, May I? May I please? Well, actually, let's, 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 oh, why don't I? Mr. Unz, and then. Oh. You've actually raised a very important point. Uh, there's a common perception that bilingual education is in some way mandated or supported in federal law. That perception is entirely false. The key Supreme Court decision, uh, which was Lau versus Nichols in 1974, simply said that schools have to do something to assist the education of children who don't know English. Guadalupe versus Tempe which was a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision, which covers California, specifically clarified Lao to say that bilingual education was in no way required. Extra help in learning English was absolutely acceptable under the Lao decision. If it in works, if it works. Well, yeah, I mean, but the current, uh, uh, you've raised also a very good point in terms of what works and what doesn't work. If bilingual education actually worked, I would support it. But it doesn't work. The current system we have in California is so bizarre that even though bilingual education is mandatory for all 1.4 million limited English children, it physically can't be implemented. There aren't the teachers, there isn't the administration, there isn't the necessities to implement it. Therefore, only about a third of the children are actually in bilingual programs. And of those third, supporters of bilingual education themselves claim that two-thirds of those programs are absolutely no good. So only 10% of the students are in the legally mandatory bilingual education program that at least would be considered adequate by the supporters. On the other hand, a quarter of the children in California public schools are actually given no extra assistance whatsoever. They are in sink or swim, even though sink or swim is unconstitutional under Lau versus Nichols. So there are almost three times as many students taught under an un unconstitutional method in California that are taught in supposedly well-designed bilingual programs. The system is an absolute and total mess and has to be changed and gotten rid of. Ms. Porter, you want to <laughs> add to that? Yes, I wanted to add to that. The perception, I, I believe I received from your statement, um, 
Bilingual native language instruction programs are not, are the, may be the preferred method, but they are not the only acknowledged, uh, uh, you know, the Castaneda decision gave a three-pronged test for what is a, an adequate program for bi bilingual children. One, it must use a theory that is recognized. English as a second language, English immersion, uh, bilingual programs are all recognized. You know, none of them are inferior to the other. And the second thing is that the school district must provide the resources to implement this. And the third, there must be proof within a year or two or three that it is improving the education of these children. So th this is a very good legal basis. Would, would either of you like to comment? On yeah, um, now I'm not an attorney, but if Mr. Un says that sink or swim is against the law, from his initiative, Article 2, Section 305, it says, all children in California public schools shall be taught English by being taught in English. And then it goes on to say that they will be placed into one classroom and only be taught in one methodology. Now, if that's not sink or swim, I don't know what is. I'm troubled by Mr. Unz's contention that the bilingual program is in trouble, and therefore what we should do is stop doing anything for these children. Just throw them into a classroom for one year with an unknown curriculum, with an, uh, a teacher of unknown qualifications. In California, one out of three of our of the, um, young people in the college age population, 19 to 22, comes from a home in which another language is spoken. We have the resources to produce bilingual teachers in California. We simply have not had the commitment to do it. Okay, now I, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to try to ask that everybody keep your questions shorter than mine was. <laughs> and would you please identify yourself? Yes. My name is Carlos Romero. I am a student of uh, the program here at the Kennedy School of Government, Masters in Public Policy. My question is for Mr. Unz. I'm a native Angelino, a product of the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, my sister is actually a bilingual teacher with a master's in education from Berkeley. My question for you is very specific. As someone with a scientific background, you must understand the necessity of having the very basic skills in math and in science to be able to compete in this technologically advancing, rapidly technologically advancing world. How do you expect children to be able to compete in this world when in the formative years of their education, they are sitting in rooms where they have no clue and absolutely no idea of what is being taught in science and math, and not to mention history, civics, and all of the other very important subjects that they must master. Thank you. That, you've actually raised a very good point. I'm glad we're touching on that. I'd like to say that we're, we're not, seriously, I mean, this is an important point. If we're talking about children who are 12 or 13 or 14 and come to the United States not knowing any English at that age and are starting school here, I think you can make a very good case in favor of bilingual education. Keeping those children up in their academic subjects and their native language while they're learning English so they don't fall behind. But the overwhelming majority of the children we're talking about who are classified as limited English in California enter the public schools when they're five or six years old. Over half of them are native-born Americans. They start school with all the other children in their neighborhood. Bilingual education, in other words, not teaching the child English as soon as they start school, I think makes no sense for five or six-year-old children. At young ages like that, all of the scientific research in neurobiology and the hard sciences shows that children can learn another language very quickly and easily in a matter of a few months if you're five or six years old. Therefore, under our initiative, the children would normally be placed in an English-oriented immersion program. They would be taught English, and then once they learned English, they would be moved in with all the other children. Furthermore, my co-proponent on the initiative, Gloria Mata Tuckman, who is a first grade teacher down in Santa Ana, is teaching a class where each year the children come in not knowing any English. They're usually Spanish speaking or Vietnamese. And in that year, she teaches them all English. And at the end of that one year, they're reading and writing and speaking English just as well as any other first grade child. What we're talking about is a complete misunderstanding of the current system. In other words, there is a perception out there. The symbolic poster child for bilingual education is a 14-year-old who comes into the schools not knowing any English. That is utterly false. We're talking about a tiny, tiny fraction of the school population. 
Finally, under our initiative, those parents who want bilingual education for their children can apply for a waiver to get it. And the older the child, the easier it is to get the waiver. Our initiative, I think, is the only approach to take with something like this. And it's also the approach used everywhere else in the world except the United States. Mr. 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 Hunt, what is the condition that has to be met for a parent to get a child out of the English-only class? That's a very good answer. The answer to that are three possibilities. One, if the child already knows English, there are no restrictions on that child whatsoever. Why so would the child be in that classroom uh, if they already know English? Me, can I finish? Can, can I finish? Okay. Children who already know English are subject to no restrictions whatsoever. Children who are over the age of 10, 10 or older, simply have to get authorization from the local principal and support from the parent to place the child in something like a bilingual or other program. For children who are younger than 10, the parent has to request a waiver and then provide some indication that bilingual education or some other methodology would benefit the child's education in some way. The indications are virtually none of the parents in California like this current native language system for the children. The overwhelming majority want their children taught English as soon as they start school, and that will end the issue. Mr. Mr. Honda, did you, did you have a follow-up? Well, in his initiative, it says that the existence of a speci such special needs shall not compel the issuance of a waiver and a parent shall be fully informed of their right to refuse to agree to a waiver. And that, that doesn't sound like it's any kind of a parent choice. Good. Yeah, I, if I could follow up on that, please. Um, in fact, in order for the parent, what you need to know that he hasn't told you is that the parent cannot even initiate this until 30 days after the school has begun and the child has been in school. So we're into October sometime now. Then the parent may initiate it. Once the parent initiates that, then in order for a child who's under 10 to, be, to receive a waiver, they have, it has to be demonstrated through some kind of testing that this child has special needs. We all know what that's code for. That's code for learning disabled, mentally retarded, there's something wrong with you. Therefore, we have to do something different for you because there's something wrong with you. In order, then once this process has taken place, and which frequently takes six to eight months in the schools right now to get somebody to come in and do a special testing, then the parent uh, has to, th this waiver process then has to go to the um, principal and to the board. By the time all of this would have taken place, there would be no possibility for a child to be placed now into a classroom that does not exist. And if the parent is successful in this process, they have to start it all over again the next year. Uh, question. Uh, yes, my name is Kevin Shapiro. Uh, I'm also a product of the Los Angeles Unified School District. In fact, a graduate of North Hollywood High School, like Ms. Johns. Um, and here at Harvard, I concentrate in cognitive neuroscience with a focus in linguistics. So uh, the, pr the question I have is for Professor Gondra. Um, you invoked cognitive science, which is something I happen to know something about, uh, and you said that learning, uh, learning proceeds best when it builds upon other learning. Now, if we were talking about something like arithmetic, I would definitely agree with you. Um, but there's a huge body of research in cognitive science that indicates that language learning is something separate, that in fact, up to about the age of puberty, language learning is rapid and automatic. And in fact, Mr. Hans is absolutely correct that it takes a very short amount of time um, for a small child to gain, profic gain proficiency in a new language. So I just uh, wondered you know, how you would respond to this um, in, in the face of you know, all the research that says that uh, language learning is really a trivial problem for a small child. I, I would respond to it in the following way, that when we talk about meaning, building on meaning, vocabulary is very important for children if children already have a vocabulary, it is an access point for them to learn to read. And um, in addition to that, I think there's a substantial amount of evidence that shows that, yes, children can learn a superficial level of any language rather rapidly, but the kind of language that is required in a classroom is of a qualitatively different sort that isn't learned on the playground or in, in superficial kind of contact, uh, language contact. And that creates a new problem for children um, that is aided when that learning occurs in their own language. Uh, yes, are. Mm -hmm. I'd like to address this and the question that was asked earlier about how a student can learn math, science, social studies in a second language. Also, how can a child learn to 
read and write in a second language. The advances that have been made in the past 20 years in methodology of teaching school subjects and language at the same time, we call it in the field content-based language teaching. You take, you use simple language at first, you're teaching an arithmetic problem or you're teaching a science experiment, and you are also teaching English at the same time. This is considered the most effective way to teach young children, and it doesn't take years. Within a few weeks, you can begin to be doing academic work in math. Within a few months, certainly, in other subjects. So it can be done. It is being done. Mr. Ames. The point that raised was a very good one. I really appreciate the support from the hard sciences where the evidence is overwhelming that children can learn language very easily. Now, the point, when I've debated this issue up and down in California, the other side always says, well, of course, if you're talking about a child learning kindergarten English or playground English, that's really quick and easy. But learning advanced academic English is much more difficult. That takes years. And that's true. But the children we're talking about are in kindergarten. If you take a child that doesn't know English and you teach him kindergarten English while he's in kindergarten, he's even with all the other children. The theorists behind the system of bilingual education actually publicly believe and say that it takes a young child seven years to learn English, starting in kindergarten, and that's lunacy. The latest study that they've come out with claims that it takes a child 10 years to learn English. They are saying that if you start teaching a child English in kindergarten, around the time they get to high school, they'll finally learn English. And that is bizarre, utter lunacy. Um, <laughs> is there anybody at a microphone up there? Yes, okay. Thanks, Leo. My name is Leo Correa. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, just wanted to thank you again for coming. And also to underscore Mr. Gon Ms. Gondara's point about the severity or the importance of this issue. Um, LAUSD, I'm also a, an alum. 40% uh, of the district's 640,000 children are limited English proficient, so this issue is extremely important. My question is for Mr. Unz. Um, you're not just, a, not just a scientist, but you're also a businessman. And as a businessman, um, I imagine that you can appreciate the value of consumer choice. And going back to what you said earlier, to what impelled you to uh, pursue this initiative, and that was that you had observed schools refusing to teach courses in English. But as I understand it, under your initiative, schools would be refusing to teach courses in Spanish. So to go from one to extreme to another, and given your value of consumer choice, how can you reconcile this contradiction? First of all, there is no contradiction. Now, our initiative has been misportrayed by our opponents in really absurd ways. One reason I brought along a lot of copies of the initiative and informational materials is those of you who are actually interested in learning about the true facts of the initiative or reading the text can just come up here. There's a table out there with a lot of information on it. Our initiative does certainly not prohibit children being taught other languages. In fact, any, I come from Silicon Valley. Anybody who works in Silicon Valley or with the world of high technology international trade knows that nowadays it's very useful for children to be taught other languages as well as English. In other words, if a child learns Chinese or Spanish or German, that's you know, a big plus. But the one essential language is English. The California public schools today, what is called bilingual education, is actually Spanish-only monolingual instruction. I mean, it sounds crazy, but it really is the reality. And that's the reason it has to change. Now, in terms of the parental uh, impact and you know, uh, protest, I mean, what we have is a current system where parents have to carry picket signs to get their children taught English. And one thing driving it, which is a very important fact that all of you should realize, and coming from the business world and the world of incentives, I think is very clear to me, is that under the current system we have, schools are paid more money so long as children do not learn English. If a child learns English successfully in the public schools, the school loses money. That gives our public schools and school districts a tremendous incentive, either in not teaching English or, in many cases, to pretending that children have not learned English, even if they have learned English. And that, I think, is the reason that they claim it takes seven years for a child to learn English, which is utterly ridiculous. Um, Mr. Chair, yes. um, it's interesting that someone can draw um, anecdotes and then draw conclusions from that. But you know, I, I, I was a principal of a grammar school, elementary school, that had bilingual Spanish. When the Vietnamese population came in, we established a Vietnamese bilingual program and, and also one for Cambodian. And you're sitting there telling me that the application of the 
practice didn't work. And yet, on a day-to-day -day basis, in, in the school that I worked in as a principal and as a, its educational leader, the youngsters were learning English and not at the expense of losing their language, but utilizing the primary language as a tool for comprehension. Now, we, have, we had a gentleman that talked about the brain, brain, development of brains. There is brand new research around uh, neurophysiology that's telling us that youngsters are learning very quickly uh, when they're exposed to languages, and they learn a lot, but they also can lose it quickly if, they're not, if it's not reinforced. Now, let's get back to some intuitive kinds of things. If you're saying that we get youngsters with, who are limited English speakers, who are going to be placed into classrooms where only English is going to be taught them, and then they're expected after one year, say they're kindergartners, after one year to speak as well as their counterpart, that uh, doesn't make any sense to me because you're asking these youngsters in one school year to be able to speak as proficiently as children who have been surrounded by English even before they're born for nine months. After they're born, <laughs> they got five years of exposure. So you want these youngsters to be able to speak proficiently as even if it's kindergarten, even if it's playground language, playground English, because I think uh, Professor Ganda is making a distinction between English, that's social English, and English in the uh, classroom, that's academic English. You want those youngsters to be able to speak as proficiently as those youngsters who've been speaking for five years, nine months, and that doesn't make any sense. The, the point in your initiative, though, it says that these youngsters will be placed in a classroom for not exceeding one year. But you have to really think about it. what does one year mean in the academic world? It's 180 days, not, two, not 365 days. You want kindergarten youngsters to be able to have a proficiency in 180 days being taught in a language they're not going to be able to comprehend and be able to speak at the same level as youngsters who are five years and nine months exposed to English. Intuitively, you just say that doesn't work. Yeah, just, just very quickly, I, I think that's very well said, but I would like to point out, too, that um, <laughs> Mr. Unz reveals his lack of familiarity with schools when he talks about kindergarten children being talked to in kindergarten language. The reason <laughs> that any of us is here tonight is because people did not speak to us in kindergarten English when we were in kindergarten, but in fact, they gave us a rich vocabulary on which to build. And children do not, are not successful in school on the basis of having received kindergarten dumbed down English made accessible um, through some kind of a sheltered program. I, I think we're going to run out of time. So what I'd like to do is collect uh, three or four questions from the audience and then invite the panelists to, to respond to them, to take notes on the questions that are being asked, uh, and then we'll give everybody a chance to, uh, to respond. Was there another microphone up? Yes. Yeah. Hi, my name is Maya Fetterman, and apparently, like everyone else, I'm a California native. Um, my question is actually somewhat similar to the last question, but I think there's still some confusion as to what is allowed by the initiative, both among proponents and opponents of bilingual education. A month, a, a month and a half ago, the city of Santa Barbara voted to eliminate its bilingual education program and replace it with an English emphasis English language learners program. The superintendent was quoted as saying, however, that the ENDS initiative would wipe out this new program. Given, um, I've always therefore been wondering about how you've decided to write the initiative in, in light of the fact that many local districts have applied for waivers to start a variety of new programs. I'm wondering why your initiative was written to mandate a specific type of program instead of written to eliminate California's mandate for bilingual education. Okay, down here, question. Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering um, in regards. I'm sorry, could you identify yourself? My name is Javier Kinney, and I'm a, a student at Tufts University. You're from Los Angeles, aren't you? I'm from uh, Northern California. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm wondering from the, the panel, um, maybe uh, particularly Mr. Unz's uh, re reaction or reflection of, of what types of implications or um, effects this type of initiative will have on the um, over 110 uh, Native American tribes and numerous unfederally recognized tribes in California that are currently uh, sustaining, preserving, and restoring their uh, tribal languages, and uh, what visions that I guess the panel has on the educational visions of these Native American students. 
and, and questions here. I'm Nicole Rodriguez, and I'm actually not from California. I'm from Boston. Um, <laughs> and I would address, I would like to address um, at, in your opening spe speech, uh, Mr. Unz, um, you said that at, at sixth grade, uh, a, a person who has been in bilingual ed from kindergarten through third grade um, will have a, both a third, uh, a, a, an education level of, I mean, an English speaking level and a, an education level of a, of a sixth grader. I was in actually in bilingual ed from sixth, kindergarten through third grade and then was immersed in fourth grade. Um, and I'm actually here at Harvard and an English major. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> besides that minor point, um, I'd like to know um, in, your, in, your, uh, in your plan, in your proposal, um, is, is the main point really to get the kids to learn English or to learn in general? Okay, and let's take one more uh, question up there. My name is Vicki Nunez, and I'm not a student here at Harvard. I actually work for the Department of Ed here in the state of Massachusetts. And um, I guess I want to reflect back on the opening um, context that was created around this in terms of the kinds of public policy that's coming out of California and whether that leads towards an ability for people in this country to live in peace and harmony with new immigrants or whether it's creating an environment of antagonism. And um, I'm particularly concerned putting this into the context of previous English-only legislation. I'm questioning what's all the concern around people learning English in the largest English-speaking country in the world where 97% of the population speaks English. So I just really want to question and look critically at whether these types of public policy initiatives lead people who live in the United States to be able to live in harmony or whether it leads to greater conflict and antagonism and violence. Since a lot were directed over here to Mr. Unz, if we just oh, very crisply and go, go across. Oh, okay, going through a few of the points. First of all, I'd like to say that there's a misperception on the part of some Anglos that Latino immigrants and immigrants in general don't want to learn English or they don't want their children to learn English. That is utterly false. The single greatest desire of most immigrant families in the United States and California is to make sure that they can improve their English skills and that their children can learn English. And that's why they're extraordinarily unhappy with the current system of Spanish-only instruction in the schools, which is why the polls seem to show that we have overwhelming support among Latinos in California. They want their children to be taught English. They're very unhappy that the schools, because of ridiculous educational theories, deny their children the right to learn English. And I think this initiative will be a very unifying initiative because it will get the votes of basically almost all the different groups in the state of California. On some of the other points, with regard to Santa Barbara and some of the other school districts, it is true that a total of four school districts in the state of California, by spending hundreds of thousands of dollars and years of effort through the legal process, have been able to secure waivers from the current mandatory bilingual education system. But that's four out of over 1,000 school districts. 99.5% of all the students in California are in districts where bilingual education is mandatory. And it just doesn't work. That's the problem with it. I think our initiative will certainly set into motion trends, which will probably get rid of bilingual education across the rest of the country as well, for one simple reason. The only problem with bilingual education is that it just doesn't work and never has worked. The Native American population. Oh, uh, sorry, with that? To be honest, I don't know the exact educational details of some of the Native American tribes in the state, but uh, it's true the initiative would, re I, I don't know if they're part of school districts or not, or whether they're even covered by state educational law or not. But it would require, if the tribes are not teaching English to their children, it would require the parents of the children in those tribes to request waivers, presumably from the tribal leaders, to prevent their children from being taught English. But I, I think probably most people in the tribes would want their children taught English as well. Okay. <laughs> One of the questions that interested me was, is the goal to learn English or to learn in general. There is no division. Uh, no one in American education is going to say that the only thing our children need is to learn the English language. They need to learn the English language for academic use, for equity, but it is not a matter of simply teaching language. It is a matter of teaching language for school purposes. 
the the policy i do not believe the policy will be divisive because i too have been in touch with latino groups i have been called to be an expert witness on behalf of the bushwick parents organization of 150 families in brooklyn that sued the state of new york because their children were not being taught english in three years, in six years, in seven years. A major suit. Las Familias del Pueblo in Los Angeles. And then I'm a pragmatist. I'm a pragmatist. It comes down to dropout rates, which are horrendous for Latino students. 37% as of the, the latest government report, this is unconscionable, when African-American dropout rates have, have fallen to 15% and are approaching the 10% for white, not Hispanics. Latino dropout rates are still high in spite of bilingual education. We need to do something better. I would simply like to repeat that since the majority, the overwhelming majority of these children, these Latino children, have never received a bilingual education, that it is absolutely absurd to blame the dropout rate on bilingual education. <laughs> Not true. Not true. I would also like to emphasize that bilingual education programs do teach English. And in fact, every study that has ever been done looking inside classrooms, and I repeat, inside classrooms rather than at newspapers, has shown that the overwhelming majority of the time is spent, in fact, in English, even in programs that purport to be heavily native language. And third, I think it's important to clarify what the public really thinks about this. In this poll that you heard about um, that was conducted just a couple weeks ago by L'Opinion in Los Angeles, 88% of the parents who had children in bilingual education programs said they were happy with their programs. They liked those programs. Unfortunately, about 50% of them also said that they would vote for the UNS initiative because it was English for the children. There is tremendous confusion out there in the public. That, this initiative was given that name for a purpose, to create that kind of confusion in people's minds, because of course, every immigrant parent wants English for his or her child. Just a closing remark. Um, the way the uh, issue around bilingual education is, uh, is framed, it sounds like this is a, a recent issue for the last 30 years. At the turn of the century on the East Coast, bilingual education was an issue among the Jews, among the Irish, and among the uh, Italians, just clearly. And then in, in, in the state of California, the whole issue around language learning is a very is a very important issue because it's not not a, only a Latino issue. It's not only a Latino issue. We have to get this really straight. It's an issue. It's an issue that affects Asians who come from different language backgrounds and other immigrants such as Ethiopians and Russian Jews. They all need language assistance for their children to be able to comprehend what's going on in the classroom. That's what bilingual is all about. It's about learning English without losing content materials and losing time in the classroom. If you really think about it, if youngsters are kept in a classroom for one year being taught English in English, those children will lose one whole year of instruction, instructional time, and that's a big waste of public taxes. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions. Uh, Dan, you had a question, and, and one over here, Irma. Bec I'm under instructions to end promptly at 9.30, so. May I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry, you're next. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Rice, I'm from Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm trying to figure out how your uh, proposal would work, Mr. Runs. If an English-speaking Anglo parent in California wants to have his or her child enrolled in a, say, French immersion school, do they have to go through this waiver business that Mr. Hahn is talking about? Okay. It, Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, quick, uh, quick right. answer. Yeah. If you're talking about a, a child who would be, uh, you're, if you're talking about a child who would be placed in an all 
non-English-oriented program, they would have to go through the waiver process. They would. Okay. And the, to, Mr. Redley asked the civil rights question earlier. Um, the Supreme Court in Laos said sink or swim is illegal. Your proposal says keep them on the life raft maybe for one year and then push them over. I suggest that's equally illegal. Okay. Uh, Dan, Dan, you have a quick question? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question for Ms. Porter and uh, Professor Gandara. I can talk to Ron and Mike anytime. Um, and this has to do with uh, a point that was made earlier. One of the advantages of the initiative process in California for both ballot initiatives that pass and fail is that it uh, allows a public debate on issues that otherwise would not take place. I mentioned at the outset tonight that legislation in the California legislature has died in committee for 10 or 11 consecutive years on this subject. There was a bill that was killed last year that is up again this year that I'd like to describe to you briefly. It's a bill sponsored by State Senator D.D. Alpert and State Assemblyman Brooks Firestone. And that would, rather than, uh, rather than uh, uh, adding a, uh, a mandate of the type that Ron is, Ron's initiative is talking about, it would simply allow each school district on an individual basis to decide whether to continue the current program of bilingual education or, as uh, Ron's initiative suggests, would remove it. And given your public policy backgrounds, I'd be interested in your reactions to that potential compromise. Okay, and last question, Irma. Hi, my name is Irma Munoz, and I'm an immigrant from Mexico. I came to this country when I was 17 and a half years old, and I was forced to either sink or swim. Obviously, I swam. Um, however, I did it at great costs. I think it was an incredibly traumatic experience, and part of what I'm hearing today has gone to address the academics of children learning English, but I haven't, you haven't addressed the issue of the psychological implications of having children being placed in environments where they can't understand a thing anyone is saying. Uh, let, let, let me start on this end and ask our, ask our panelists to respond to those as they will and also uh, wrap up this just was briefly. Local choice. I believe there was a question regarding SB 6 um, as a uh, compromise bill uh, in terms of uh, a replacement or an alternative to the uh, um, Proposition 227. To me, uh, there, there, are, there are no choices. There are two separate distinct issues. One is a statute that deals with bilingual education, and the other is a, uh, an initiative that would be uh, law and outlaw SB 6 if passed. Um, <laughs> Mr. Schnur raises, raises the issue that for 11 years this has dragged on and that we have not been able to come to some kind of a consensus. I don't have any particular problem with SB 6. I think the problem that's been out there is that for a long time now we have known how to do this right. And yet the will, the political will, has not been there to do it. And I think this is the frustration that people have felt with voting for a bill that is um, you know, a little patch here, a little patch there, but not really doing what we know how to do well. I have followed the uh, workings of the California legislature very closely and reviewed the bills that have been introduced at least every year for the past five years and have never, have gone into oblivion. I think many of the uh, conditions in those bills, I believe were very favorable, local choice, I have been advocating this in Massachusetts for years, where we have a very strict bilingual education law that allows only native language instruction programs. I would have liked to see the D.D. Alpert bill or some of the others come through. So 11 years go by. In the absence of legislation, the California Department of Education keeps the mandate for native language instruction. As Ron said, only four districts out of 1,000 have received waivers to do an English language program. Instead, it should be a local choice. Can you comment on the psychological cost issue? Ah, oh, the psycho. <laughs> um, I, like you, came to America when I was six years old, sat in a classroom in Newark, New Jersey. Nobody knew my language, and nobody helped me at all. It was sink or swim. I swam. Uh, that's not the ideal way. But we are not talking about sink or swim. We are talking about helping children learn the language quickly. 
we know m very good ways the El Paso study, which compared English immersion students with transitional bilingual students in the same school district, the same Latino children, no difference in self-esteem, no difference in stress level, which are the things that bilingual advocates say happen to kids if they are put into English language too early. There are good ways of doing it. Mr. With regard to that point, somebody who comes to the United States not knowing any English and starts school at the age of 17, regardless of what method you use, will certainly be under a lot of strain in the public education system, whether you use immersion, whether you use bilingual, whether you use anything. But the overwhelming majority, almost all the children we're talking about are five or six years old. And at that age, teaching them English is a very, very easy thing to do with almost no psychological cost whatsoever. Could you comment? And I'm sorry. Sure. Could could you could you comment on the alternative that Dan Schnoor? Oh yes, exactly. Uh, I'd like to say it's interesting it's because local control sure. is supposed to. Right. There was a, there's been a bill proposed now four years in a row in the state legislature, the Alfred Firestone bill, which would allow local school districts to decide what sort of program they would have. The bill was defeated four years in a row by the supporters of bilingual education. I think the bill was a very bad bill for other reasons, and now it's essentially moot point since people are going to be voting on our initiative in about three months. Uh, let me uh, let, let me take one liberty. A brief a brief announcement uh, that uh, upstairs in the penthouse, uh, immediately following this event, uh, there is a reception. I should emphasize it is a fundraising reception sure. for uh, for the Harvard Journal of Hispanic Policy. So all of you inc are encouraged to go upstairs and take your wallets with you. It'll be a great party. And uh, in conclusion, let me, if, uh, let me just uh, take the liberty of expressing uh, two concerns about uh, the way this seems to be unfolding. Uh, one is that uh, it is very interesting to me that the issues of race and color uh, have not yet been explicit in the discussion of bilingual education and in the debate in California. And, uh, and I fear, frankly, that some of the attitudes on the underlying policy issue, uh, and I'm not, I'm not speaking here in an ad hominem way, but I'm just saying that I, I would expect uh, that there is some fraction of people out there whose view about bilingualism, uh, whose view about this educational policy issue is infected with, uh, let's say, nativist, xenophobic, uh, perhaps racist, perhaps discriminatory attitudes. And what will be interesting to explore is whether the tone of the debate that we've seen tonight uh, that tries to stay above that uh, can be maintained through the debate uh, on this proposition uh, in the months ahead. Uh, the second thing that I wanted to uh, raise, however, uh, is the question of the role of evidence and research. Um, I have reviewed some of, the, some of the research studies. As part of the Civil Rights Project here, we've, we've had some conferences discussing bilingual education and issues affecting uh, the civil rights of, uh, of Latinos. Uh, and the research is confused. Uh, I was just reading before this discussion tonight a meta-analysis of over 75 studies on bilingual education. Uh, the Kenji Hakuda study that uh, was mentioned earlier uh, is a very important and impressive document. The research evidence is mixed. It is very difficult to interpret. But what, is, what concerns me, I think, about the way that this debate is unfolding is that the fundamental touchstone of what will be best for the children in creating opportunity and trying to wrestle with the question of what is known as an answer to that, often gets lost in hurling charges back and forth, of hurling anecdotes back and forth, of appealing to personal experiences as opposed to what can be gleaned from systematic research. I've had experience as a political hack, so I know that research does not usually drive policy debates. But here is one that is so, here is one that is so fraught with implications for our social cohesion as well as for the opportunity in America that I sincerely hope that the discussions ongoing in California and throughout the nation can be as thoughtful as the one we've had tonight, and perhaps even better. 
please join me in thanking our panelists and thanking the Institute and the students at the Kennedy School for doing this. Carmen, I'll be right back.